In the Northern Hemisphere, as we look up to the sky and we watch the stars rise and set as Earth turns on its axis, only the North Star, called Polaris, doesn't move. And that's because the Earth's North Pole points directly at it, so it stays in a fixed position as Earth moves so that we can always use it to navigate and find North. In the Southern Hemisphere, though, there is no South Star because the Earth's South Pole just happens to point in a direction where there isn't a star that we can see with our eyes in that direction. But it won't stay like that for long because the poles are shifting. In fact, in just over a thousand years, Polaris won't be the closest star to the North Pole. Pole. And even weirder still, because of this same process that's causing the poles to shift, our seasons will flip too, giving us summer in the northern hemisphere where we usually find Earth in its orbit in January. So what is going on? Well, as the Earth spins on its axis, it wobbles around a little bit, just like a spinning top does when you set that spinning on its axis. And it traces a circle every 26,000 years, changing the direction that it points all the time. This is something that we call precession. So this total precession of the Earth's axis that we have is actually caused by the sun, the moon, all the other planets and objects in the solar system pulling on the Earth slightly. So because the Earth is spinning, it is not a perfect sphere shape. It's what's known as oblate spheroid. It bulges slightly at the equator and is squashed at the poles. And that's because of this force that pushes outwards on the Earth, similar to what you feel on a roundabout pushing you backwards when you hold hands with a friend and spin around. So if we think about the forces at play on the Earth from the sun, for example, half of this bulge will be slightly closer to the sun than the rest of the Earth and half slightly further away from the rest of the Earth. So the force will be strong on the half closest to the sun, since the force of gravity is proportional to the distance between objects. This creates a slightly uneven force of gravity on the Earth, which is pulling roughly perpendicular on 90 degrees to the Earth's axis of rotation. It creates a torque, essentially yanking on that axis, causing it to rotate and process every 26,000 years. Meaning that we've not got that long left of Polaris being our North Star because the North Pole is no longer going to point exactly in that direction. In fact, even at the minute, it doesn't point exactly at Polaris. It's about 0.66 degrees out right now. But then by the year 2100, it's going to have crept ever closer to the closest it will come at 0.45 degrees out. After the year 2100 though, that's when the Earth's North Pole starts to drift away from Polaris. So much so that by the year 3000, the Earth's North Pole will point halfway between Polaris and Gamma Cephei, a star in the constellation of Cepheus, which is about 22 times fainter than Polaris, and it'll get ever closer to it until the 41st century. It's a pretty interesting star. It's a lot closer than Polaris first off. It's about 45 light years away compared to Polaris's 430. 33 light years away, but it is also much smaller as well. It's only about 1.3 times the mass of the sun, whereas Polaris is about 5.4 times the mass of the sun. But one thing it does have up on Polaris is that it has an exoplanet, a planet orbiting around it. In fact, it was actually one of the very first ever exoplanet discoveries from back in 1988. So important that it now actually has a, you know, like a real name. It's called Tadmor rather than the, you know, very unlyrical scientific name of Gamma Cephaid AB. Supposedly <laughs> a lot a lot more boring, uh, but it was all thanks to the NAME ExoWorlds project that was run by the International Astronomical Union that got the public to suggest names for various important exoplanets. Tadmor was actually submitted by the Syrian Astronomical Society. It's the ancient Semitic name for the city of Palmyra, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Tadmor, the exoplanet, is about 1.85 times the mass of Jupiter. It orbits its star about every 900 Earth days or so at a distance of about two times the distance of the Earth from the Sun. And it was actually confirmed as a planet in 2003 using the radial velocity method, which looks for little Doppler shifts in the starlight caused by the planet being so big that it shifts the center of mass of the whole star planet system so that to orbit each other, causing the star to wobble to towards and away from us. I mean, I won't live to see that, but I think it'd be pretty cool for future humans to be able to look towards the North Star and know that they're also looking towards a planet that's orbiting that star as well. But again, 
that also won't last very long. Because in 8,000 years time, the star Deneb, the tail of Cygnus the Swan constellation, will be closest to Earth's North Pole. And in 12,000 years time, one of the brightest stars in the sky, Vega, will be closest to North. In the meantime, in the Southern Hemisphere, the star Iota Carinae, also known as Aspidisca, will come closest to the South Pole in the year 8000 AD. I mean, all of this is fascinating, right? But the really interesting implication that comes from the precession of the Earth's axis is when our seasons are in the Earth's orbit, will change. So the seasons are caused by the Earth's axis tilt, right? So in the Northern Hemisphere, in winter, the Earth's axis tilts us away from the Sun. But six months later, on the other side of the Earth's orbit, the very same axis tilt means that the Northern Hemisphere then points towards the Sun and we have summer. The seasons are not caused by the fact the Earth is closer to the Sun in its slightly oval-shaped orbit that's not a perfect circle. In fact, Northern Hemisphere winter actually occurs when the Earth is closest to the Sun, something we know as perihelion, peri meaning close, helion meaning sun. And that currently happens in our January. And similarly, when it's in the position in its orbit, taking it furthest away from the sun, something we know as aphelion, that currently happens in our June. But if the Earth's axis is precessing, that'll change all that. In 13,000 years, it'll be halfway around that circle and it'll be tilted in the opposite direction when it's at perihelion and aphelion, meaning that the Northern Hemisphere will now point towards the Sun and have summer when it is at its closest position and away from the Sun to have winter at aphelion and vice versa for the Southern Hemisphere. Since the Northern Hemisphere has a much greater landmass than the Southern Hemisphere, that's going to actually create much more extreme summers for the Northern Hemisphere. The thing is, though, it won't mean that Northern Hemisphere summer then happens in December and Northern Hemisphere winter happens in June, because our modern Gregorian calendars, as they're called, already take this into account. It's all about how they define a year. You can define a year by two different ways, right? You can say, okay, a year is how long it takes for the Earth to come back to the exact same position in its orbit. And we can measure that based on the positions of the very distant stars. That's something known as a side real year. Or you can measure it based on, well, how long does it take for the sun to come back to a very specific position at a very specific time of year? For example, on an equinox at noon when you expect the sun to be directly overhead. That's something known as a tropical year. Our modern calendars are defined based on a tropical year, on the position of the sun, which means that when the equinoxes or when the solstices, i.e. the middle of summer or middle of winter actually happen, don't change in the calendar itself. It already takes into account this drift that's happening over many, many years with leap years, which means that the equinoxes and the solstices always happen at roughly the same time in our calendar, you know, June and December, like mid-June, mid-December. In ancient times, this wasn't the case. They didn't use what's known as the Gregorian calendar, they used the Julian calendar. So in fact, if you actually look at the date of the summer solstice going from the year 1 AD all the way to about 1750 AD, which is when the new Gregorian modern calendar was introduced, you can see that the date shifts from the 25th of June all the way to the 10th of June, about two weeks or so, which is what you'd expect. The calendar essentially corrects for this drift of the date of the summer solstice with leap years. So we'll still call it June when the Northern Hemisphere has summer in 13,000 years time, but the Earth will be in the position in its orbit that we currently call December now. What will change is the stars we can see at different times of year and locations around the world. For example, Orion now is a winter constellation, but here it is in the middle of June in 13,000 years time. Similarly, Cygnus the Swan is a summer constellation, but here it is in the middle of December. And what's more, because we're at a different angle then, here's the center of the Milky Way in Sagittarius, rising in mid-December in the UK. Look, even Crux makes an appearance, which is just mind-blowing for any astronomer out there. You know, this is a typical Southern Hemisphere constellation. This shift in when we could see different constellations was noticed by ancient Greek philosophers like Hipparchus and Ptolemy. Now, they called this the precession of the equinoxes compared to the background stars. But what they really figured out all the way back then, like 2,000 years ago, was the difference between a tropical year and a side real year. 
this shift in the equinox of, of two weeks in terms of the date that it was happening at was why, you know, like the whole motivation for why people wanted to change the calendar in the first place. Although it was really in the 1500s that this took off because the Catholic Church pushed for it because they wanted to celebrate their holiday Easter at the time that it was originally meant to be celebrated. A lot of countries in Europe then followed suit over the next century or so, but it wasn't until 1752 that Britain and its empire, you know, including territories like the eastern coast of the US and Canada, adopted this new Gregorian calendar and changed from the old Julian calendar. The problem was, was that the Gregorian calendar was actually 11 days ahead of the old one. So it meant that the day after the 2nd of September 1752, wasn't the 3rd of September, it was the 14th of September, 1752. This led to what's known as the Calendar Riots, where people were outraged that they'd been robbed of days of their life. You know, they demanded that they be given back these 11 days. I don't know whether there's going to be similar riots when Polaris is no longer our North Star, because, well, a thousand years is a hell of a lot longer than 11 days. But I can't help but wonder, well, the internet absolutely lost it when Pluto was demoted. So I can't help but wonder how it will react when they find out that Polaris gets demoted too. Before we get to the bloopers, a huge thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Brilliant is an interactive STEM learning platform with hands-on courses across a huge range of science, maths, and computer science topics that really engage you with the why and the how of a concept, so you have a much better understanding of a topic. Essentially, you learn by doing, which is the way that I've always found I learn best. Brilliant have a great astrophysics course that covers everything from the brightness of stars to dark matter into the expanding universe. But part of that course is also on the things the Greeks managed to figure out all those thousands of years ago, from the size of the Earth to the distance to the moon, just from the careful observations they made just like they did with the procession of the equinoxes that we heard about in this video. So if you fancy brushing up on a little bit of science history, or you fancy testing yourself on more complex astrophysics topics, then head to brilliant.org forward slash Dr. Becky, or you can click on the link in the video description down below, and the first 200 people will get 20% off an annual premium subscription. So thank you so much to Brilliant for sponsoring this video, and now, roll those bloopers. In the Southern Hemisphere, though, there is no South Star, and that's because the Earth's South Pole just happens to point in a, di in a di di direction. Tad more, much better than the, you know, very boring scientific name of Galpha, Seph, Ga Galpha? <laughs> well, Gamma? Uh. Or how long it takes the sun to come back to the same position in the sky on a certain date, like the equinox, which is known as a tropical year. Tropical? Topical. Tropical. Such a weird name for it. A tropical year. I'm like, a tropical year to me is a year spent sunning myself in the tropics. <laughs> Meet me on the equinox. Meet me halfway. We won't know when it is. We'll be confused in the middle of the day. 